portugués y uh, también español no es mi lengua materna. Entonces, I'll give my presentation in English. I hope that's okay. Known for his part in the Elgzilis controversy, Luis de Molina made contributions to late scholastic thought that extend well beyond those theological disputes concerning grace and human freedom and divine foreknowledge. He made considerable contributions to the topic of international law, the use gentium, and its relationship to the just causes of war. Decades earlier, Francisco de Vitoria, one of the reputed fathers of international law, had helped had developed his own understanding of the Ius Gentium in the course of arguing against the stripping of dominion from the indigenous peoples of the New World. The wars that the Spanish crown waged against the American Indios to Vitoria's mind could in no way be justified, for the natives enjoyed their own dominion. Indeed, the circumstances surrounding the Spanish interaction with the natives were such that there was not a sufficient violation of the prescriptions of the Ius Gentium to legitimize any war that could dispossess the natives of their dominion. Molina, however, offered an alternative account of what constitutes a violation of the Ius Gentium, and along with it, a diverse set of conditions that would establish justification for war. In particular, the scope of dominion relative to the Ius Gentium is a point of difference. For Molina, the Ius Gentium establishes private ownership, which means that it cannot abrogate such a right. Accordingly, Molina's conditions for a just war are much less restrictive than those of Vittoria. Many have pointed out that the abiding concerns for late scholastic moral theologians was not simply the articulation of an abstract moral theory that could be admired a longe. Rather, aware that they were responsible for educating confessors to whom it fell to offer counsel to their penitents, many moral theologians were moved above all by pastoral concerns. Indeed, when a penitent happened to be a prince or emperor with responsibility for governing the affairs of the Republic, the confessor's responsibility to serve as a moral guide became all the more acute. This is especially true with respect to offering counsel in the face of war. With gravity, Molina remarks, quote, a prince who provokes war assumes the character of a judge concerning his opponents in the gravest matter in which not only is that very matter concerning which war is provoked addressed, but also the slaughter of many and other most grave evils inflicted upon the Republic, which undoubtedly also contains many innocent people." End quote. Unlike other affairs of state, such as establishing taxation, legislating relief for the poor, and the like, war, one could argue, has the gravest of all moral consequences since it directly appears upon the evangelical counsel of charity, especially the command to love one's enemy, and it affects the lives of so many. It is not just the combatants' lives that are at stake, but vast populations of non-combatants, the innocent, who will also suffer despoilment, enslavement, and worst of all, perhaps, death. It is no wonder, then, that in the course of his treatment on war, Molina addresses such questions as, whether in a just war it is allowed to kill innocents, whether it is just to kill the children of infidel enemies, whether it is allowed to kill or enslave hostages, or even whether it is lawful to spoil the innocents of their possessions. To contemporary ears, these questions strike one as outrageous, as frankly do some of the answers and reasonings with which Molina responds. But where Molina and contemporary sensibilities converge is the gravity of warfare. War is nothing to be taken lightly, and there can be no doubt that the prince or sovereign has a grave moral responsibility to ensure that any war he wages is a just one. Any sovereign who rushes to war on account of passion or negligence incurs a most grave fault and bears the burden of making restitution. Nevertheless, a sovereign also cannot fail to uh, or neglect to wage war when necessary since it falls to him to defend the republic. To, Mil to Molina's mind, in a fashion similar to Suarez, the sovereign derives his authority from the republic and is subordinate to the common good of that republic. Such being the case, it would be a mortal sin for the ruler not to wage war when warranted, that is, when the security of the republic is at stake. Likewise, it would be a mortal sin for the prince's subjects not to fight in such a war when commanded. If it is the case that both waging a war and failing to wage a war could each be mortally sinful, then it falls to the moral theologian to determine for the sake of helping confessors guide sovereigns, for the moral theologians to determine what are the necessary conditions for a just war. Here, 
Molina follows Thomas Aquinas, who Secunda Secundae of the Summa Theologiae serves as the basis of the De Justitia Iure, on determining the conditions for war and holds the famous three necessary conditions that we all know. The first necessary condition is that war is authorized by some legitimate authority, a prince or sovereign. Uh, the reason for this is that war is not simply a skirmish or fight between individuals or even some sort of brawl, such as we've heard over the past several evenings. Rather, war is, according to Thomas, quote, as a multitude against a multitude, end quote. Whereas individuals can take their dispute to some higher authority for arbitration, a sovereign has no superior, and as we've seen from Molina, functions as his own judge. Accordingly, only the sovereign can authorize a war on behalf of the republic. The second necessary condition is that there be sufficient cause. Finally, the third is that a just war, for a just war, it is required that it have a proper intention. Since we are presently concerned with the justification for war relative to the use gentium, the secondary necessary condition, the second one rather, uh, that Molina identifies is particularly worthy of further consideration. First, Molina sketches the parameters of um, cause for war before descending to a consideration of particular causes and concrete examples. The most basic cause for a war, for a just war rather, is that some republic suffers an injury. Aquinas had likewise cited injuria as a cause for war, and he writes, quote, whence Augustine says, a just war is often defined as one that avenges injuries, end quote. Noteworthy here is that Thomas unfolds his account of just war in Uria within the context of his discussion of charity, whereas Molina couches his discussion within the economy of rights or dominion. That is, at the heart of Inuria is use, <coughs> for Molina is a right to dominion. Here we recall uh, Professor uh, Zimmermacher has already described this, but uh, we can uh, briefly repeat this here. Uh, Molina holds use is some faculty of making or of obtaining or preserving, uh, that thing, or having that thing in some other way, all of which, if without legitimate cause, is opposed, results in an injury. Okay, so that's Molina's thought. As an example, Molina thinks that war between the Israelites and the Canaanites and Amorites was just because God had given to the Israelites the lands that the other two occupied. The injury here consists of the Israelites being dispossessed of property, namely their land, to which they had dominion by divine dispensation. For both Thomas and Molina, then, a just war presupposes some guilt or fault upon which the party, uh, uh, fault upon the party against which the war is waged. But for Molina, the emphasis is placed upon guilt, which arises from the disposition or dispossession of some dominion to which one has a right. Be that as it may, Molina goes on to subdivide war that can be justified in the basis of injury. First, there is a war that is waged in order to take vengeance for some injury. Quote, whether or not simultaneously we intend to recover our goods and to repair damages done to us or not, end quote. For this kind of war, it is necessary that there be some fault on the part of the enemy. What is more, adds Molina, the gravity of the enemy's fault is determined by the, quote, degree of the value of the thing which they owe us and yet do not wish to hand over, end quote. The second kind of war waged on the basis of injury, Molina argues, occurs when an injury is inflicted through the enemy's taking possession, belonging to another party through invincible ignorance. Since the enemy acts through invincible ignorance, no fault is presupposed. The war between the Israelites and the Canaanites and Amorites serves as an example since the latter two had no knowledge of God's donation of their lands to the Israelites. There was no other way besides resorting to war for the Israelites to recover the dominion over their land. In this case, because the Canaanites and Amorites acted without guilt, there is only a material injury as opposed to a formal injury when one's opponent acts through knowledge. Nevertheless, for Molina, even a material injury, when it is of sufficient gravity, can serve as a just cause for war. In short, given the manner in which Molina develops his reasoning for a just cause of war, we see that injury is a correlative to dominion. If one has no right to dominion with respect to some object, then one cannot suffer injury by that object's reallocation to another use. But just because, or, but just what is this dominion and how it has come into being? Furthermore, is such dominion always some kind of tangible good? Not necessarily, for according to Molina, it was a just cause for David to, to, David to wage war against Hanon, the king of the Ammonites, quote, to whom heralds had been sent by David for the purposes of saluting him in friendship, but in contempt, Hanon shaved half their beards, 
and cut half their garments uh, in half up to their buttocks, end quote. So not a very friendly reception. Nevertheless, the preponderance of the examples Molina cites regarding dominion do in fact pertain to tangible goods. This is consistent with his general account of dominion, which again, as we've been told already, comes from Bartolo, uh, Bartolo de Saxoferrato, quote, it is the right of completely dispossessing or disposing rather a corporeal thing unless, Ill or unless legitimately prohibited from doing so, end quote. Molina subsequently divides and further subdivides dominion first into dominio jurisdictionis and dominio proprietatis. Former pertains to political power, whether that be of the church or of the state. The latter, more relevant to our considerations, is also further subdivided into dominium universitatis and dominium particulare. But what is the source or root of dominion in general? That is to say, what guarantees one a right to something, whether that be a tangible good or a governing power? For Molina, our dominion results from our having been made or created in the Imago Dei. Just as God has dominion over all creation, human beings likewise participate in that dominion to a certain extent. What is more, since we are made in the Imago Dei, as we, insofar as we are rational and enjoy free will, Molina identifies dominion with freedom. By nature then, that is to say, according to the use naturale, humans are accorded dominion over the rest of the world. Yet such dominion would thus far seem to be general, or dominium universitatis. Indeed, as many medieval thinkers held, uh, like Molina, that prior to the fall, all goods were in common. Quote, for things were preserved and bestowed to the entire human race indistinctly, end quote. But here, the question arises, what is the source of dominium particulare? Molina's answer is simple. As we've been told already, the fall itself is the cause of the division of goods into dominium proprietatis. That is, in order to ensure peace and tranquility, it was necessary to divide goods among various provinces and cities, which need gave rise to governors. Prior to the fall, goods necessary for human sustenance were abundantly available and could be attained without labor. But after the fall, such goods became scarce, and the labor required for sustenance only increased, which became all the more concerning given man's new proclivity to laziness. Just think of the internet, for example. As Molina sees it, if all goods were simply left in common, there would be no incentive to cultivate them or toil for their sake, which only would lead to further scarcity and want. For this reason, then, became expedient to divide goods for the sake of human preservation and flourishing. Molina holds that the division of goods comes about neither through the use naturale nor through the divine positive law. Nevertheless, the division of goods is not contrary to either the use naturale or divine law, which means such division is listed at least for expediency's sake. This human law, which, as Molina understands it, is simply the use gentium and serves to establish the division of goods. But if it is the case that the use gentium establishes the licit division of goods, can it also serve as a just cause for war if those goods <coughs> should remain private and fail to return to the common enjoyment as Victoria seems to think? Well, having established the right to dominion, Lena, <coughs> as we have seen, holds that a sufficient injury resulting from the illegitimate dispossession of that dominion can serve as a just cause for war. Well, Lena, Victoria had earlier argued along similar lines against the Spanish conquest of the New World. It was clear to Vittoria that, given the organization and self-governance that existed among the natives prior to the Spanish arrival, American Indios were in possession of their own property, meaning that they too enjoyed dominion. Accordingly, that dominion could only be abrogated for a just cause. Vittoria discounts a number of reasons given to justify the war, for example, the claim that the natives were sinners, unbelievers, or madmen, etc. Victoria argues that only a violation of the Jus Gentium could justify the Spanish crown's waging war. The Jus Gentium ensured one's rights to travel freely, trade and prospect in unclaimed territories, enter into partnerships, engage in communication, as well as to send and receive ambassadors. In essence, Victoria's vision of the Jus Gentium is predicated upon a truly international or global understanding of human nature and the rights that follow thereupon. The community and rights that emerge from that nature are such that the dominion that follows upon them is equally global and cannot be infringed upon by a single nation. Molina's conception of dominion vis-a-vis -vis the Jus Gentium is somewhat different. For Vittoria, the Jus Gentium attenuated a particular republic's to absolute control over its own dominion, so as to respect the prior claim of the global community to that dominion. Accordingly, 
No nation could fail to accommodate travelers, merchants, and missionaries within its territory without incurring fault, which would serve as a just cause for war on the part of the injured nation. Molina, however, is an expressed disagreement, as he himself notes. The rights and dominion of the Republic are analogical to the same rights and dominion of the individual citizen, the prime analogate, as it were. Just as an individual rightfully owns private property through his participation in the divine dominion, as we've seen, and is justified in the determination of that property's disposition, so likewise the Republic justified in determining the use of its own dominion. That means the Republic, for example, can't lawfully prohibit commerce, a port, or habitation. Molina holds, quote, Also, one cannot deny that ports, rivers, and mines of gold and silver pertain to the dominion of whose province in which they are located. In fact, the nearby coastal region adjacent to the mainland only pertains to them whose province it is. And also, for that reason, they can seize for themselves the right to fish and also the right to prohibit others from fishing in that place, end quote. In short, on Molina's view, dominion, understood as the right to private property, has a stronger meaning and value both for the individual and the nation than seems to be the case with Vittoria. Be that as it may, Molina is in broad agreement with Vittoria as well as Castro and Covarrubias, whom he also cites in their claim that to deny someone something guaranteed by him, guaranteed him by the Eus Gentium, represents an injury and is thus a cause for just war. It's just not the case that access to harbors, commerce, highways, etc., is a right guaranteed by the Eus Gentium. What constitutes, then, the denial of a right guaranteed by the Eus Gentium? Molina adduces as particular examples of such denials, Caesar's being denied or prohibited to enter Rome by the Senate, as well as Israel's war against Sion, the king of Amorites, for denying them passage through their lands. Nevertheless, when narrowing his focus upon what constitutes the scope and extent of the Eus Gentium, Molina attenuates his claims somewhat. For example, when considering whether the Eus Gentium permits one to travel in a foreign territory, here, one can think again of the Israelites and the Amorites. Molina deliberately departs from Vittoria. Vittoria thinks the Eus Gentium per permits the following. One, travel through foreign lands. Two, the use of the foreign territories, rivers, and ports, which in fact he thinks are common to all. Three, the pursuit of business in a foreign province through importing goods. And four, prospecting for valuable metals and or minerals. Accordingly, with this set of rights in mind, to return to Vittoria's own immediate concern, he thinks that since the native Indios did not deny Spanish any of these rights guaranteed by the Eus Gentium, and since there was no other just cause for aggression, the conquests of the natives through Spanish arms remain fundamentally unjust. Molina has a different view. <coughs> Without considering the issue of the Spanish conquest of the New World, Molina, for his part, weakens the rights of the Eus Gentium, guarantees which in turn restricts just causes for war. The Jesuit agrees that the Eus Gentium guarantees the aforementioned rights, but only in cases of extreme or grave need. The reason for this is that the Eus Gentium is itself beholden to the law, well, law of charity, which demands that, without being able to prejudice the division of things, anyone whosoever can use the things which he extremely needs, even against the will of the owners." End quote. Here, one can think of fleeing through a neighbor's field to escape the attack of a wild animal, or using water from another person's well to extinguish a raging fire in his own home as examples of extreme need. Nevertheless, in ordinary non-emergency situations, Molina finds that the use gentium does not guarantee the aforementioned rights. The implication of that claim is that withholding the use of public waterways, travel, uh, foreign commerce, etc., does not represent an injury and is thus not a just cause for war. Molina does, not, uh, does note that for the sake of proclaiming the gospel, Christian preachers have a right to go where they will, even into uninvited lands, unmolested. Yet it seems that this right is no, not so much established by the Eus Gentium as a Vittoria held, but by the evangelical command to go and make disciples of all nations. Accordingly, not only do Christians have a right to go into foreign territories to preach the gospel, but to protect, uh, they also have the right to protect Christian, Christian missionaries from violence. Molina points out, though, that should it be the case that the infidels do not wish to receive the faith, their rejection of the faith does not itself serve as a just cause for war. One may reasonably ask whether non-Christian religions also enjoy the right to spread their own faith into Christian territories and bring along with them their own military escort. 
while Molina does not address this question, I think I can infer uh, what his answer would be. Uh, no. Does this mean that Molina operates with a double standard? I don't think so for the following two reasons. First, as we've seen, the right of Christians to preach the gospel is not so much a right guaranteed by the use gentium, rather it is guaranteed by a higher divine law, which no doubt Molina would deny as operative in non-Christian religions. Second, the use gentium is itself subservient to the higher use naturale, which itself is a participation in the divine law. For this reason, Molina thinks it is lawful for Christians to intervene and curtail the practices of infidels that are contrary <coughs> to the natural law. But here again, Molina qualifies his position. No prince, not even the pope, has the authority to punish infidels over whom he is not the sovereign, for sins that are contrary to the light of nature, such as idolatry. Molina argues that the infidels' crimes are not such as would inflict injury upon innocence. No military action against them, then, can be justified. The implication of this claim, of course, is that nations are empowered to defend the innocence of another nation upon whom are inflicted injury by their own sovereigns. For example, Molina thinks it is just for the Spanish to intervene in the case of human sacrifice, uh, which often occur for the purpose of consuming the victim's flesh. Indeed, it does not even matter if such sacrificial customs are universally approved by the indigenous populace, since those practices remain contrary to the natural law and can therefore be justly suppressed through military action as Molina sees it. But again, the authorization for military intervention in such cases does not so much derive from the use gentium as it does for natural law. For the Christian moral theo theologian, the reality of sin is a grave one and cast its shadow over all things. It is because of sin that dominion that was once enjoyed in common came to be divided among nations and people become dominium proprietatis. It is also because of that sin that our corrupted desires envy unjustly what justly belongs to another and can serve as a cause of conflict. Sin then causes the disposition or dispossession of dominion and subsequently the inuria that can be a sufficient and just cause of war. As Joao Fernandez rightly points out, quote, war had to be seen from the point of view of the transmission of property, with the remark that those who lost properties uh, lost it against their own will. In other words, the problem of war in the theory of Molina was the problem of how to legalize violent dispossession, end quote. With war, as with all things, the devil is in the details, and this is especially true in determining its justification. For Melina, as we have seen, the use gentium helps establish the licit division of goods, the trampling of which can serve as a legitimate cause of war. Only in the most extreme cases of need can the dominion of another be justly taken, which means conversely that in all other cases the dispossession of dominion can serve as a just cause of war. Thank you.